What am I saying? When you unmask, you reveal. It means to go public. Last week, we encouraged you to go public on, on, on your social media platform, and, and I want to encourage you to do the same. Right now, if, you're on, if you have your phone, you're like looking at the Bible going, you want me to jump over to Facebook? Yeah, jump over to Facebook, whatever platform you're on, and just post, I'm at Ocean Way Church. Where are you? I love my church. Where are you? Some, post something. What you're saying is, is I'm revealing where I am. You're going to do exactly what Jesus is doing. Last week, it was interesting after service to watch some of the people that did post that. And when they did, uh, people had conversations. They extended the conversation outside of this room. So if you are worshiping with us outside this room, go ahead and share the feed because we just believe that somebody needs to hear this message. Today, the word that I'm going to share with you, I, I struggled with it a little bit because it wasn't the message that I prepared for this weekend. It was the message that I prepared for next weekend. And I felt like it, during the week, God was like, no, you need to shift and, and talk about this this weekend because somebody's either going to be in the room or outside the room that needs to hear this. How I many know sometimes that's a conversation the pastor has with God? And I'm like, okay, you really want me to? Okay, I'm going to do this. So yesterday, most of the day, I'd already written a bunch. And yesterday, I was like, okay, let's write some more. And then last night, let's write some more. And this morning, yeah, you know what I did? I wrote a whole lot more. So um, tell your neighbor, say, hold on, you're going to be here for a, for a little bit. Okay, John chapter 11, verse 1. This is the story of Lazarus. And uh, we're going to read um, chunks of it because it's really long, but I want you to get the heart of it because here's what God's going to reveal. I want you to look through this lens. Jesus reveals his love. In this situation, he's going to reveal his love to three people, to Mary, to Martha, and to Lazarus. The word says this in verse one, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany in the village of Mary, the village of Mary and his sister, Martha. Verse three, so the sister sent word to Jesus. He's sick. Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said this, this sickness will not end in death. You gotta highlight that, underline verse four. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And then in verse five, John wants us to know, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two more days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Jump down to verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So Lazarus dies, and Lazarus dies. Remember, it's, it's two days. He waits two days, but in this verse, it says that Lazarus has been dead for how many days? Come on, say that again. How many days? Oh, there's five of you got it. How many days? Woo! Come on now. So he's dead for four days. So when, the, when those people came and brought word, when those servants came and brought word, Lazarus was already dead in that moment. But here's what you need to understand. Jesus knew what the end result was. He said, this isn't going to end in, res, in, in death. This is going to be for God's glory. Jump down to verse 20. And when Martha heard that Jesus was approaching the village, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, this is powerful, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Jump down to verse 34. And he said, well, then where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men also have kept this man from dying? Boy, there's haters even there. Come on now. They're just like, couldn't even come to the rescue. But verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, comes to the tomb, and it was a cave, and the stone was laid across it, and Jesus told them, roll away the stone. Then Martha said, Lord, he's been dead four days. The smell will be terrible. 
I don't know if you read it like that. That's the way I do. But verse 40 says, just Jesus looked at her again and said, didn't I tell you that if you will believe in me, you will see God unveil his power. So they rolled away the stone. And Jesus gazed into heaven and said this, Father, thank you that you have heard my prayer. For you listen to every word I speak. Now, so that these who stand here with me will believe that you have sent me on this earth as your messenger, I will use the power that you have given me. Then with a loud shout, oh, I love this. Then with a loud voice, Jesus shouted with authority, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. Then in front of everyone, Lazarus, who had been dead for four days earlier, slowly hobbled out. He still had grave clothes tightly wrapped around him, his hands, his feet covering his face. And Jesus said to them, cut him loose and let him go. What I believe that God wants to reveal to us today is his true nature. And his true nature in your situation, whatever your situation is, is love. So let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you for speaking to us through this word. God, thank you, Lord, for what you're gonna reveal to us today, God. Mold us, shape us, make us, God. Help us to see you in a greater way. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, say amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's celebrate God's word today. So if you're taking notes today, if you're, if you're online, they're gonna drop the notes in a, in a comment where you can link to those. If you're in the YouVersion app, look under events and pull up Ocean Way Church and you can see everywhere I'm going and even places I may not be going, but go there and, and, and you can take notes. Why? Because I believe everyone that takes notes actually grows in their faith, actually remembers what God wants to say to them. Also, they go to heaven too, so that's really a bonus. You know, if you take notes, you go to heaven. No, you can quote pastor on that one, okay? Because one day, I'm telling you, everybody that took notes is in heaven. Hello, the people that didn't, let's go on. Okay, so what's your main point? Here's my main point. When it comes to Jesus's love, his love is not measured. When you measure something, you know that there's a limit. His love is not restrained. When you restrain something, you keep it from something. But his love is released. When Jesus came into this world, he came to release his love on this world. He came to release his love in us. The greatest way that he releases his love is through the church. The church is still the vehicle that God uses. The people that are in the church, they are the church. That's the vehicle that God uses to release his love on this world. Somebody this week needs to experience the love of Christ. And you know how they experience it? They come in contact with you. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. Come on now. Some of you are like, ooh, you mean they're going to run into love? I hope they're going to run into love. This is what I want to encourage you with today. See, the first thing when you look at Jesus' love in this story, here's what he's trying to reveal to us that his love is not limited. His love is limitless. When he looks at the ladies and the ladies send word to him and said, the one that you love, the one that you love, Jesus, I wanna remind you, Jesus, the one that you love is sick, so you need to come. And Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's gonna be for God's glory. It's the perfect place for God to show up and show out his glory in this situation. See, when something's limited, it has a, a measure to it. There's, there's a measure to it. Your car has a limit as to how far it will go. I don't know if you have a car that it, it pops up with a number and it says, you can go 64 more miles, 64.2 more miles because of what gas is in your car. Um, I had a car when I was a kid that didn't even have a gas gauge. It was broke, so you had to get out and shake the car or, or think, how much did you put in it and, and realize, am I going to run it? Some of you are laughing because you probably had the same kind of car. You know what I'm saying? It was just one of those things. You're like, how many ever run out of gas before? See, we run out of gas because we tried to, to, to go beyond the limit, hello? We tried to expand the limit in our horizons of how far that we can go. When that light comes on in my car, that light blinks at me, and that light tells me, you're almost done, you're not going to get very far, and there's a thought in the back of my mind that says, I can go just a little bit farther. How many is with me on that one? Come on now. See, that's how we understand limits. When it comes to limit, you understand a limit because you have a credit card, and your credit card has a limit to us. Um, when it comes to driving your car, your car on the road, regardless of how fast your car is made to go, guess what? There is a sign that's white with black numbers on it that says under it, speed limit. I know that most of us think that that's optional. We think that that's just a suggestion. 
When you ride down the highway, if the suggestion is 70, how much, how, I mean, everybody, I'm driving 80 and, okay, let's go. I'm driving 80 and everyone's left side, right side, whatever side, doesn't matter. The slow lane is the middle lane. So everyone goes on both sides of you, you know what I'm saying? So I'm thinking I'm driving by because I want to, I don't want a ticket. I don't need a ticket. And I just don't want to pay for that ticket. But I'm thinking there is a speed limit. When you drive down New Berlin Road, somebody passed me on Wednesday night. They were driving 70 miles an hour and down the middle of the road, double yellow line, everything, parking space and everything. I'm like, well, that person's in a hurry you know, to go. I don't know where they're doing what they're exceeding the limit during this pandemic. I saw this. I don't know if you saw this. I saw this a couple weeks ago. I was in Target because, you know, there's things that have run out. So I'm in Target when they open, and I go in, and there's these signs that says, limit one per customer, limit one per customer. And I watch this lady walk up and just rake off a bunch into the cart and go, there's no more limits. And I looked at her, and I said, that's the way I want to live. Come on now. How many want to live that way? Hello? I seem like that's just wrong, Pastor. I understand and you understand because of the limit, when you look at this situation, this limit that was on this man's life, sickness had come into his life. Whenever you're sick, whether you got food, flu or the, or the COVID virus, guess what? Your life is limited in quality and quantity. Your life is limited by the sickness that's on you. You just want, when, when I have the flu, I want everybody to know I have the flu. I want everyone to know how miserable it is. I just want to just, just to do nothing and want everybody to feel sorry for me. And every, anybody with me on that one? Come on now, we get really, okay, only three of you. Let's go on. But um, sickness has a limit. Lazarus in this situation, he was at the, what? He dies. And Jesus says this, he says, this sickness will not end in death. Some of us look at death and we see that's the end. Guess what? Death is not the end. Death is the beginning because Jesus came to raise dead things to life. Jesus came to give us eternal life. How many are thankful that one day you're going to have a brand new body? Come on, how many are thankful that eternity is made for you? So when we're looking at the scripture, we got to realize that our situation may be limited, but God. My situation may be limited. I may only be able to see the limits that are placed on my life and my restraints and those types of things. But guess what? There is a God in heaven who his love is limitless, that he wants to pour out his love in our hearts and in our lives. Remember what the sister said. The sister sent message and they said, Lord, the one you love is sick. And Jesus' response is simple. This sickness, he recognized that he's sick will not end in death, but it's the perfect place for the glory of God. You know, whenever you're, you're, you're going through something, whatever you're walking through right now, I wanna encourage you. Right now, your situation is the perfect place for the glory of God. Your situation is the perfect place for God to put his glory on display. When Jesus put his glory on display in this man, he put his glory on display and everybody saw it. Why not look at it as this situation that I'm walking through is a great place for God to show up. I may be limited in resource. I may be limited in a lot of different things, but you know something? When it comes to my God, his love is limitless. Do you believe his love is limitless? Come on now. So stay with me. When we, when we look at this, we've got to realize, so... If his love is limitless, you've got to understand that his love is not just limitless, but it's constant. It's consistent. It doesn't waver. To be consistent means to be regular. It means to be steady. And Jesus reveals to us in this moment that, that his love is consistent. I don't know about you, but I like consistent things. I like things that are consistent. I like things that consistently happen on a regular basis. It's a regular rhythm that happens. When I was a kid, I would consistently go to the refrigerator and open up, and there would be milk in there, and I'd grab that gallon of milk, and then I would go to the cupboard, and I'd pull them Fruit Loops out. You know I mean? Consistently, they would be there. I don't know how they got there. I kind of ignored the fact that somebody else put them there, but they were there for me. I would pull those out. I would pour those into a bowl, and then I would pour the milk, and it is a bad day when you went to the cupboard and that box, you picked it up and you went, choo, 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 choo. And you're like, there ain't nothing in here. Come on now. What's going on? And I was like, did I do that? Did somebody else do that? Or it's, it's even rougher now as an adult when I go to the freezer and I pull out the freezer and I look down and I reach for ice cream. And in my heart, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be good. And then I pick up this thing and I'm like, what's in here? 
there's maybe a scoop. You ever been there? You know what I'm saying? You know what that's called? That's called frustration. Hello? Why? Because somebody ate everything and just left enough to let you get a taste. You know what I'm saying? They just gave you just a little bit, just enough to drive you crazy. How often do we take what's consistent for granted? You know what's consistent? Your bills are consistent. Every month, every month you're going to get a power bill. You're going to get, if you have a cable bill, you're going to get a cable bill. Hello. And if you don't pay either of those two bills, guess what? Consistently, they will come and they will turn off those two things. You know what I'm saying? That's consistent. I mean, if I don't, then they don't. Okay. That is something that is consistent. Something else is consistent. It's if you scroll into Facebook, you are consistently going to be asked, have you registered to vote? Hello. Come on now. This week, consistently. Every single day, I would go to my mailbox. You know, the snail mail, I'd open up my mailbox and I would pull out not one, not two, usually three. One day it was five political ads, hello? I mean, I'm like, just like, oh my goodness, wow, that guy hit the lottery or something, you know what I'm saying? I just, I mean, every single one of them and I take them over to the recycle bin and I drop them in there, why? Because it's just paper, it needs to be recycled, hello? Some of you are like, 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 whatever. But um, what am I saying? I'm saying it's, it's consistent. What happens when we run into something that we take for granted as consistent? Sometimes we look at God's love and we take it for granted because we, we, we can't measure it, because we can't feel it at times. I went on a, um, a trip to Canada several years ago. And when I flew into Canada, I forgot that it was a foreign country. I didn't think it was a foreign country. And when I flew into Canada, I realized when I got there that I didn't turn my phone on. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I didn't get an international plan or anything like that. And I had to drive two hours to a summer camp because I was preaching in a camp. And I flew into Ottawa and I show up and I'm like, get this car. And they're like, you want a GPS? I'm like, no, I got my phone. I'm, I'm good. Everything's good. And I get out in the car and I look at my phone and I'm like, oh, this is a bad day. This is a really bad day. I don't have any access to my maps or anything. It doesn't even know where I am. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm in Canada. I'm thinking, what's consistent about this? McDonald's and Home Depot. And what's consistent about it is both of them had Wi-Fi. So I pulled into the McDonald's parking lot and didn't have enough. So I, I went by and you dr I dr actually drove around looking at stores, trying to figure out, holding my phone, thinking which one's going to log into to the, oh, here's one. And then I pulled up the map, took a screenshot of it, and I was able to get there. You know, how, you know what happens when, when we take something for granted that is always consistent? When it's not there, we get frustrated. And the reason why it's not there is because we place a condition on it. Sometimes we get frustrated with God because we place a condition on his love. Love is not conditional. Let me say that again. His love, it's not conditional. It's not conditioned on what you do or what you don't do. It's conditioned on the fact that he is God and he chooses to love us. Do you believe that today? Come on, clap if you believe that. So when I look in the scripture, John wants us to know something. He, he, the, the, the sister sent word to Jesus that the man that you love is sick but the Bible says that, that John says this in verse 5. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Right there in the middle of it, he says he loves him. But then he says, and then Jesus stayed two more days right where he was. John's reminding us. Maybe today you need to be reminded that God's love is consistent regardless of what you're going through. Sometimes when we look at love, we look at it, we think, well, well society frames love around the good things. If you look at what the way society posts pictures and, and different things about love, they post it around the great things, the good things. This is love because it is good. If you understand that God's love doesn't change, then I can have his love and his love can be great in the good and the bad. Because why? Because it's consistent. It doesn't change. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can't do. There's nothing I'm walking through that his love doesn't show up and be there every single time I need it. What God is revealing is that his, his love is consistent in the good and his love is consistent in the bad because in this situation, this was bad. Understand, these two sisters, they're distraught. They're upset. They're crying, they're weeping, they're mad, they're, they're all kinds of things in their loss. And, and then Jesus shows up and he wants to reveal to them that, that love is not inconsistent. When love is inconsistent, there's an assumption that's tied to it to make it conditional. What are you saying, Pastor? Here's what I'm saying. That when love is built around conditions, it always leads to unhealthy assumptions. Because when we think, well, if, 
if my bills are being paid, or if my husband loves me, or if my, my kids are good, or if they get good grades in school, if certain things happen, if I get a certain job, or get a certain house, or get a certain car, or have a certain dog, then guess what? Then I attribute God's love to that. An unhealthy assumption is what happens when we place a condition like that on love because we all know that sometimes you can buy a car and it can be a bad car. Hello? Sometimes you can get a job and go, man, this is the greatest job. I just love it. And then you get on the inside and realize there's people there. And those people are not the nicest. You know what I'm saying? I've talked to people. They're like, man, I, I lost my job. I've gone through this and lost my job. And here's my prayer for them. Every single time when God gives you a job, it's not just going to be any job. It's going to be a great job. And the people that are at that job are going to be what? They're going to be kind. Hello? How many want that kind of job? Come on now. How many know some people that aren't so kind at, at work? Pastors, put your hand down. I'm just kidding. When it comes to God's love, if we have this assumption that there's a certain condition that needs to be attached on it for his love to be real, for his love to be, be tangible in our lives, then we miss the very fact that his love is what drew him to this planet to, to, to bring freedom and to bring forgiveness to our lives. If you look at the story, you realize this. Here's Mary's assumption or Martha. Martha says this to Jesus. So Jesus shows up two days later, and, and Lazarus has been dead for four days. Understand this. On four days, when you're dead in that, in that culture, if you were dead three days, you could come back to life. There's a possibility that, boom, you'd pop up and everything would be good, and you would come back to life. But four days, you're dead as dead. In their book, when it's four days, it's over, it's end of story. Nobody's coming back after four days. But Lazarus was dead for four days. In verse 21, she says this, this is her assumption. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So she assumes this. She assumes that the condition of Lazarus is due to the absence of her Lord. She assumes, why, why does she assume that? Because she says, uses the, the conditional word, if. Everyone say that, if. You ever said if before? If I marry this woman, if I get this job, if I have this happen, then X, Y, and Z is gonna happen too. Those are what? Those are conditional assumptions that we place. But when we place those assumptions on God, then we miss the very fact that his love is consistent, that his love hasn't changed. When we place those things, we realize that, that, that well, if God doesn't show up in this, if God doesn't do something here, then guess what? He must be absent. Where do we find in scripture that God is absent? Where do we find in scripture that God is absent from anybody or anyone? Just a little theology understanding. The Bible says that God is omnipresent. That means there is no place on this planet that he is not. There's no place that he can exist that he is not. So wherever you are, guess what? When you are at work, he is there. When you are online, he is there. When you are at home, he is there. When you're at the Jaguar game, he is there. Whatever place you find yourself, guess what? God is still there. Come on, clap if you understand what I'm saying. This is a little deep. So if you look in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, God is love. So if wherever I am, then God is there. And if ever I am, God is there, then guess what? God's love is there. The thing that changes it is my perception and my understanding of, of the condition I place on his love. What did she say to him? She said, if you had been here, then my, my brother would not have died. She's telling Jesus that if he had showed up, then Jesus, he would not be dead. And she's placing this assumption on Jesus. And she's saying that it's conditional on the fact of you showing up and not showing up. Here's where, here's where the issue is. Her, her frustration, she's completely frustrated with Jesus at this point. But her frustration has nothing to do with the fact that he's the son of God. Because she says that he's the son of God. Her frustration is, has nothing to do with the fact that he can bring someone back to life. Her frustration is with Jesus' timing. She says, you didn't show up when I needed you. You didn't come when I asked you. You showed up and it was late. I felt like you were late. Have you ever, you ever ordered something online? And um, I'm telling you, you go to my front door at my house this past week and every day, I don't know why, but every day I walked out there and I'm like, oh, here's a box with a smile on it. Or here's a bag with a smile on it. 
I'm like, somebody loves me. Come on now. And, and, and I would go out there, and, and I'm telling you, every single day, Amazon showed up at my house consistently, and it wasn't me. I don't know who it was, but it wasn't me. And I'm looking at that thing going, whoo, and that's consistent. One day, like today, there probably won't be a package, and I'm like, What's up with this? You know what I'm saying? I, I consistently want to, now, now I'm thinking something did show up because my camera went off and told me that somebody was at my front door just a few minutes ago. And I'm thinking, well, maybe, just maybe, somebody in my house ordered something, you know? And, but, 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 but here's the problem with Amazon. Here's the most frustrating thing. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you ordered something on Prime Day. You know what I'm saying? You got like, oh, I ordered it. And then you got it. You think, I'm going to get it in like two days. And they send you the tracking number and it says, in 21 days, you're gonna get this. And at the end of 21, like right the day that you're supposed to get the package, you get another email. This is the most amazing email on the planet because it really makes you feel good about what you ordered. It says, your package has been delayed. <laughs> you ever been there? You ever see, like it's delayed. You're like, where is it? And then you start tracking it and you're like, where did it go? They let you track it and they're like, well, it went from China, I think, and then it went to New York, then it went to Atlanta, then it went to Virginia, then it went to Miami, then it went to Orlando, then it, I don't know why it does all that. Then it shows up in Jacksonville, and you're like, it's coming today, and it doesn't come today. It doesn't come. And then you get that email that says it's been delayed. Timing. I don't know about you, but when things are delayed, if, if delay is in play, then the, 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 it's a whole lot easier to be frustrated than it is to be faithful. See, in this situation, Martha, maybe she didn't need to see that Jesus was absent. Maybe she didn't need to say, hey, if you were here, he would not have died. Maybe she needed to say that the delay right now is not denial. The delay is that he's going to show his glory in this thing. See, the assumption is you're not here. The assumption is he is absent. The assumption is there's no way this can happen. But that's not real. The assumption is about a condition. It's not about the consistent love that God pours out because he's always on time. How many believe he's always on time? Come on, clap you believe it. Come on, I'm waiting on you. How many believe he's always on time? So when we look at delay, sometimes we look at our life in the context of delay. I don't know about you, but have you ever been frustrated to the point that you ask God, God, where are you in this? Why can't I see you moving in this? Understand this guy, he hasn't moved in four days. They put him in that tomb four days ago. They put a stone in front of him because they felt like this was it, this was the end. And Jesus, the creator of the universe, shows up. And, and when he shows up, she says, if you had been here, that he wouldn't be dead, then we wouldn't be weeping, then we wouldn't be mourning, then we wouldn't be going through this thing. I don't know about you, but, but when delay is in play, that it, it's a whole lot easier for me to be frustrated and wonder, okay, God, are you really moving here? I don't know about you, but, but I ask those questions. I'm telling you, if I could be as transparent with you as possible, this pandemic that we've gone through, we're running out of it. That's the way I look at it. We're running out of it. We're running away from it. We're running ahead of it. We're saying, God, it's, 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 it's not gonna attach itself to it. That's the mentality that I place on it. But in the middle of it, I'm like, God, is this gonna end? And, and you get frustrated, you're like, are you really moving in this thing? And then you have friends overseas that, that are in the hospital and they're on ventilators. Then you have friends in, in another state that are, on, that are they're in the hospital too. And you're like, this is real. And you're like getting frustrated, why? Because of timing. Timing is our thing. Delivery is his thing. Whenever I think that God needs to deliver on my time, then I miss the fact that he is the author of time. And if he's the author of time, then when he delivers in the right time, that's when his glory can show up and it can impact everybody. Jesus stood there at the, at the mouth of the tomb and he tells them to roll away the stone because this death will not end in death, this sickness, but this will be the place for God's glory to show up. Maybe, ooh, just maybe today, you're in a frustrated place. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you came to church, you're like, Pastor, I'm just, I'm just, I don't see things moving, and I want to see things moving. 
I feel like my life is in delay. I feel like I'm living in the midst of a pause. I feel like I'm, I'm in a place where I don't see the things around me moving and I keep praying and I keep pushing and I keep, I keep trying to make things happen on my own. And maybe God is just telling you today to let go of the timing and hold on to the creator of time and realize that whatever you're walking through right now is the right time for his glory to show up, is the right place for his power to show up, is the right place for his love to surround you. Because Jesus doesn't just, he's not absent. It's impossible for him to be absent. So if it's impossible for him to be absent, then it's impossible for his love to be absent. It's only when we place a condition on his love that we see that it's absent from our situation. But I want to encourage you, he's never stopped moving. Even in the beginning, in the very beginning, if you look all the way back in the book of Genesis, when the earth was, for, was formless and void and there was nothing there, what does it say? And the Spirit of God was hovering and moving. When your situation seems formless and lifeless and void of any future, void of anything, guess what? That is the perfect place for the Spirit of God to move over. And when He moves on it, that's when life happens. See, what Jesus needs to reveal to us, that even in the midst of something that dies, that he can bring things back to life. Why? Here's what he said. Mary said, if you'd have been here. Jesus says this. He says, I am here. Maybe today you're saying, if, if, if. And maybe you need to realize that he's saying, I am, I am, I am here. I am the resurrection and the life. The word life there is Zoe. It means fully alive, fully functioning in every possible way. If he's the resurrection and the life, then whatever seems dead, guess what? All he has to do is speak to it and it comes back to life. Lazarus, dead four days. He stands at the entrance of this tomb and he yells his name. Now, when I say three, here's what I want you to do. I want you to yell your legal name. Just yell it so that people around you can hear your name. Because some of you don't, they don't know what your legal name is. They just know you, what you get called by. So you're like, you want me to yell my legal yeah, my, my legal name is Albert, okay? I got one laugh from first. I got a whole lot more laughs in the first service. You know, my legal name is Albert. I've never said this, but well, I did the first service. Albert Manning Force the third. Huh. And the fourth is sitting right there. Come on now. And one day the fifth is on the way. Hello? <laughs> Not anytime soon, but let's go. Let's do this. But, but I want you to yell your legal name. You ready? One, two, three. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, I know you have a voice. When Jesus shouted into, listen, there was a crowd of people around there weeping and wailing. I want, you to, I want you to shout your name. You ready? As loud as you possibly can. You ready? One, two, three. See. Maybe, just maybe today, you heard your name come out of your mouth. And God has been saying your name every day. He's saying, come out of what's dead. Come out of what's discouraging. Come out of frustration. Come out of the pain. Understand this, when Jesus stood there and he said, show me where you laid him. And when they brought him to it, you know what his reaction was not yelling his name. His reaction was weeping. The Bible says that Jesus wept. Why? He understood their pain. He understood their frustration. He understood what, what they were going through in that moment, and he hurt for them. You know what that tells me? He understands what we're going through. He understands when we, we have all this pain in our life and these, these shortcomings and different things that we struggle with, and he just wants you to know that he can bring life to your situation that his love changes everything. That his love will rearrange and, and change everything because Lazarus, he said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus didn't think, well, should I, should I not? You know what I mean? He's laid down, he's all wrapped up in all these things. And somehow he hopped to his feet and started hopping out the tomb. And everybody was, I mean, their jaws dropping down. Everybody's freaked out. And this is the moment in scripture that all the religious leaders decided he's got to go. It says that, that from this point on, they all chose to murder Jesus. 
They all chose what the path that he would take so that we could live. He knew why, you know, I wonder if he wept because he knew that this was the moment that everyone would realize that he is the author of life, that when he speaks, life comes into dead things. So maybe your checking account is dead. Maybe your, 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 your marriage seems kind of on the edge. I'm not gonna say dead because I just don't believe it's dead. I just believe that when God speaks, God can bring things to life. Do you believe that today? Come on, clap, do you believe that? So here's what I wanna encourage you, stand to your feet all across the building. We're gonna sing a, a song and, and I want you to listen to the voice of love because the voice of love is what's calling your name. And I don't know what situation you're going through. I just know this, that this is the perfect place for you to run into his presence and for his love to bring to life whatever may seem on the edge, whatever may seem dead in your life, whatever's not moving in your life. I wanna encourage you today. If you're standing out there, I wanna encourage you to come. If you're like, I, if, if you've been frustrated, if you've been discouraged, if you've asked the question, Lord, when are you gonna move in this? You ever ask that question? Lord, when are you gonna move in this? And the way you say it is about the frustration, about you see what the future is, you know what God's saying about the future, but this right here is what's standing in the way. Maybe you just need to step out and come and stand in the front and say, God, I just wanna, I just wanna hear your voice. I just wanna be wrapped in your arms of love. I just need to know that I know that I know. And today he wants to reveal his love. His love is limitless. His love is not absent. His love is what shifts and changes everything. So I believe the moment you step out from where you are, what you're going through is gonna shift and change because His love changes everything. So Father, in these next few moments, God, Lord, as we worship you, Lord, let your love be lavished on people, Jesus. Lord, may we experience and encounter your love in a fresh way, Jesus. Lord, somebody's come frustrated. Lord, somebody's come discouraged. Lord, somebody's asked the question, Lord, how are you gonna move in this, Jesus? Lord, I pray that as we move towards you, Lord, you'd bring life. Lord, you'd bring health. God, you'd bring, Lord, that unconditional love and wrap it around us, Jesus. We honor you. Come on, let's worship him. Lord, if you need prayer, I want you to come. If you want to step out and step into his love, I want you to come. Come on, step out. Bring your wife with you. Come stand in his presence and say, God, I choose love. I choose you. I choose to stand in your presence. Come on, come and stand. Hey, thanks for checking out this message today. If you are blessed by the message and you'd like to sow into this ministry, you can do so on our website at oceanwaychurch.com.